Okay, so some really important stuff today and and this week. Uh, he says as his computer just freaks out. Um, there we go. So we're going to be moving into applications. And one of the main tools we'll have when we're studying applications is fixed points. And we talked about fixed points before, but when we talked about them before, we were talking about fixed points on the line. Now we want to talk about systems of linear equations and fixed points on the plane. So we're going to look to be looking at systems of linear equations like this. Um, no reason you should remember this after all these months, but these systems are called autonomous. And um, what makes them autonomous is that the variable t is not explicitly showing up on the right-hand side. Um, things are changing with time, but time is not showing up explicitly in these equations. And I mean, that makes sense for a lot of real world situations. I mean, if you think about like animal populations and I mean, well, that maybe not the best example because animal populations like have breeding seasons and stuff. But if you're looking at like a predator and a prey model, and the predator animal eats the prey animal, um, you might create an equation where the population dynamics only depend on how many prey animals there are and how many predator animals there are. If there are few predators, the prey population goes up. If there are too many predators, the prey population goes down. And in such a model, you're not asking, well, what year is it? So things are changing with time, but time isn't directly showing up in the equations. And we'll see plenty of examples of autonomous models as we go through um, our examples. The, um, the way it's the easiest way to think of, of solutions to a differential equation like this is to think of a point moving around a plane as a line passes. So you start wherever you are, at t equals zero, and as time passes, we move around the plane. So this is sort of parametric thinking, um, in the sense that parametric equations are also curves that you think of as sort of moving around the plane. Um, so a fixed point of 
then our car name is system is a point x comma y that makes both the derivative is zero. So maybe dx dt is 2x minus 3y dy dt is 4x. What would a fixed point of this be? Well, a fixed point is a value of x and a value of y that makes both the um, derivatives equal to zero. So for dy dt to be zero, 4x has to equal zero, and x has to be a zero. Then up here, for 2x minus 3y to equal zero, well, we know we've already solved for x. We know that x has to equal zero because, um, because of that second equation. And we wind up with a fixed point, x equals zero, y equals zero. And as a, uh, as a general statement, The derivative systems that we've been looking at, these linear homogeneous equations um, with constant coefficients, are going to have the origin as a fixed point. Um, most of the time, I'd say the origin is going to be the only fixed point, but it's possible to create messy matrices A, where that is not the case. Um, and in fact, we're going to devote quite, well, not that much time, but we're going to devote some time to studying this fixed point in particular. Before we move on to studying this fixed point in particular, let's refresh on a few definitions. Again, these are things that we theoretically might know because we theoretically learned them uh, in like chapter two, but that was in like the third week of class or something. So we haven't seen this for a long time. A fixed point is called stable. If values near 
the fixed point remain near the fixed point. And you know, there are ways to fancy that definition up. If you've taken Mr. Vogel's analysis class, you can define this very formally in terms of epsilons and deltas, but no need, I think, for that. We'll understand this kind of informally. Yeah. And again, you know, the easiest way to think of this is parametric. You know, so here's a fixed point. Here you are. Time passes. If you're stable, you have to stay near the fixed point. So maybe you actually get closer to the fixed point like that. Maybe the way that you stay near the fixed point is to just go around it again and again and again in a closed orbit. But if you start near the fixed point, you have to remain near it. That's the definition of stable. A fixed point is asymptotically stable if it is stable. And not only do we stay near the fixed point, we actually converge to it. So looking at these pictures, here's a picture of asymptotic stability. Uh, we start near the fixed point, we stay near the fixed point, and not only do we stay near it, we seem to be spiraling in towards it. Let's not crunch things together on this frame. Here's, I think, a new definition. A fixed point is neutrally stable if it is stable but not asymptotically. Stable. So we did sort of talk about the idea of neutral stability, oh, those several months ago. We said that being stable and being asymptotically stable are not the same thing, and that if you mean asymptotically stable, you need to write it out. So here is 
is an example of neutral stability. If we start near the fixed point, we remain near it because we're orbiting around, but we're not actually converging towards the fixed point. And then sort of that leaves us unstable, which none of the above. So if a fixed point is unstable, we can have trajectories that start near the fixed point, but then move far away from it. And again, it's possible to put this all in a very formal way. What do we mean by being near a fixed point? But we're going to understand it in this kind of informal setting. Now, two fixed points can share stability, but look rather different from each other in terms of what trajectories are doing. So, for example, let's draw on the board two asymptotically stable fixed points. In the first case, Trajectory is near the fixed point. Just dive in to the fixed point. You can think of the fixed point as like a gravity well or the bottom of a, of a pit with curved sides and stuff is rolling in straight towards the fixed point. In the second case, maybe you have something like this. Trajectories are approaching the fixed point, but instead of going in in the kind of straightforward way that we see on the left, they're sort of swirling in. So on the left, you can think of the fixed point, as I say, as being like the bottom of a bowl, and you can think of trajectories as being balls that are rolling down the side. Here, we can think of the fixed point as being the center of a whirlpool, and, you know, debris is swirling around the whirlpool, but also being drawn in towards the center. So these fixed points are both asymptotically stable, but they're clearly different from each other. So we should have, we should state two goals here. We want to find the stability of a fixed point. Uh, asymptotically stable, neutrally stable, or unstable. And then we want to go further. 
we want uh, classify the fixed point. It's asymptotically stable, but how is it asymptotically stable? Are trajectories just going straight in? Are trajectories swirling in in a whirlpool pattern? Or maybe there are other options and trajectories are approaching the fixed point in some other way. Well, the good news is that um, we're going to answer in most cases, or in a lot of cases, we're going to be able to answer both of those questions more or less at the same time. And we'll start with the special case X prime equals A X. And even though everything we do with this case can generalize to other cases, we'll assume for simplicity that A is a two by two matrix. And I'll say that both these goals are accomplished using eigenvalues and eigen factors. And to see what eigenvalues and eigenvectors have to do with anything. I mean, suppose we have x prime equals ax, and the matrix A has two negative eigenvalues. Then we could solve this and after the dust cleared we would get this as our solution. And then we ask, well, what happens as time passes? What happens as T goes to infinity? Yeah. Well, are we snow with my leg? Drives me crazy. What on earth did I get to? I was trying to get to Desmos. And I mean, maybe I could just say this at this point in our 
mathematical career and we would not need a graphical evidence. But if we have e to a negative number, then as t goes to infinity, I mean, you see this goes very quickly to zero. And that's true regardless of the specifics, whether this is negative four, negative two, negative 0.1, negative 0.1, it might take longer, but as time passes, this is going to zero. So as time passes, because both these eigenvalues we're imagining are negative, those exponentials are going to zero very, very quickly. This C1 V1 isn't changing, it's a constant. Likewise, this C2 V2 isn't changing, it's a constant. So a constant times something that's going to zero plus a constant times something that's going to zero. This thing is approaching the origin. It's approaching the zero vector, which is the origin on the Cartesian plane. So because stuff is not merely staying near the origin, but as time passes, these trajectories are actually approaching the origin. The fact that we have two real negative eigenvalues is giving us information about the stability of the fixed point here. It's saying that the origin is an asymptotically stable fixed point. And now we're going to introduce a bunch of cases. It's kind of a waterfall, but um, it has to be done. So all of these cases are going to be easier to understand if we make the following observation. that values that start on an eigenvector remain on the eigenvector so i sometimes think of trajectories as like currents we've got some bobber in a lake or in a river and we've got currents that are causing that bobber to move around. And in that sort of simile, um, eigenvectors are like channels that the bobber gets stuck in and it can't get out of. 
Um, with this out of the way, let's start looking at cases. We've actually looked at a case, um, but maybe I'll come back to that. And I'll start with the saddle. And again, to make sure we're on the same page as to what we're actually doing, we're looking at x prime equals ax. The origin is a fixed point. And our goal is to classify and sort of understand what sort of fixed point the origin is. Asymptotically stable, neutrally stable, or unstable. And then, you know, if it's asymptotically stable, is it a whirlpool? Is stuff just going in towards it? What's going on? So that's our goal here. And I'm going to start with what's called the saddle case, where the matrix A has two real eigenvalues, one of which is positive, one of which is negative. So, and I'm starting with the saddle because it's a really nice and um, example of how I can vector in addition to eigenvalues, are giving you information. So we have a fixed point. The origin is a fixed point. Um, there are two real eigenvalues, so there are two eigenvectors. And we're going to think of eigenvectors as basically lines here. Ideally, straight lines in spite of my inability to draw a straight line. So, I mean, properly speaking, eigenvectors are vectors. But multiples of eigenvectors are still eigenvectors. So here is an eigenvector, and it either corresponds to the positive eigenvalue or the negative eigenvalue. Let's say it corresponds to the negative eigenvalue. Let's now choose a less eye-searing color for the second eigenvector. Here's another eigenvector. And we'll say it corresponds to the positive eigenvalue. So on an eigenvector, um, if the eigenvalue is negative, we move towards the origin. 
And if the eigenvalue is positive, we move away from the origin. So I've called, well, I haven't. I'm about to say that the saddle is unstable. Um, it's true that there are values that converge towards the origin. And that's points that are literally on the eigenvector. But every other trajectory moves away from the origin. And to see this, again, it's maybe sort of helpful to think of these as like, as currents, you know? So let's say we start here. What happens to us? Well, we're near this fast moving current that's going towards the origin. So we're drawn towards the origin, but as we get near the origin, we're also getting near this other eigenvector, and this other eigenvector is pointing down and to the left, it's drawing us away from the origin. So when we, let me, uncolor that. So we get drawn towards the origin for a bit, but then we get near this other eigenvector and we're taken away from the origin. You know, similarly, if we start here, we're near this pink eigenvector, so we get drawn towards the origin for a time, but then we get close to the other eigenvector and we're drawn away from the origin. Drawn towards the origin, but then drawn away from the origin. Drawn towards the origin, but then drawn away from the origin. So here, the origin is an unstable fixed point. And again, it's called a saddle. I mean, I mean, the reason it's called a saddle is that someone at some point, I confess to not being a horse person, so I can neither confirm nor deny, but someone at some point saw a picture that looks like that and said that it looks like a saddle to them. Hence the, uh, hence the name. So, the saddle is two real eigenvalues, one positive, one negative. Probably the next question it would occur to us to ask is, um, well, what if they're both positive? Or what if they're both negative. So, I should warn you ahead of time, the terminology I'm using is standard or mostly standard. Um, but you can go online and find other people using different terminology. 
Yes. So the terminology I'm using in this class is the terminology that I want you to use. So the next case we'll consider is where the origin is what's called a node. And in this case, we have two eigenvalues. One of which, nope. That would be a saddle. And these eigenvalues are either both positive or both negative. And a node can be either unstable or asymptotically stable, depending on which of these two subcases we are in. So let's um, let's look at the case where. The eigenvalues are both positive, are both negative. And just to make life easier, I'm drawing a picture where the eigenvectors are super nice and they're actually just the axis and they hit each other at a 90 degree angle. Um, there's no reason real eigenvectors should look like that, but it's going to make the picture sort of easier to explain. So in this case, um, well, everything seems to be moving towards the origin. So it's probably not surprising that, uh, you know, the origin is asymptotically stable. The exact way that we move towards the origin might be surprising. You might think, well, we're going down towards the origin and we're moving to the left towards the origin. So we should just be going in towards the origin. What's actually happening is that we approach the origin along parabolic curves. So we are approaching the origin, but we're not going straight in. And um the reason that's happening is that if we have two different eigenvalues and they're both positive, then one of them is bigger than the other. And the bigger eigenvalue and the eigenvector associated with it is causing a bigger effect. So if we look at this picture, you know, to start with, um, this sort of eigenvalue direction, this eigenvector is being mainly ignored. To start with, we're basically going down. So this 
eigenvalue associated with this eigenvector is bigger and it's doing a better job of controlling the direction of motion. So we start by going down, and then eventually we do get close to the other eigenvector, and it sort of sweeps us away. But we wind up with these kind of parabolic curves. And I mean, I drew, the way I drew these um, suggests that one of the eigenvalues is stronger. You could also have your parabolic curves. Like so. So that's the case where they're both positive. The case where they're both negative looks identical, except that the direction of the arrows is reversed. So now, values go away from the origin along these curves. And that's the node case. So, um, Nodes, again, they're either asymptotically stable or they're unstable. Um, just making sure we get it down in the writing. If the eigenvalues are both positive, the origin is asymptotically stable if they're both negative the origin is unstable And again, if one of them is positive and the other is negative, we're in a different case. That puts us into the saddle case. So, what remains here? Um, well, what remains, just going down the checklist, we could have a repeated eigenvalue. That is, we could have only one eigenvalue. Or we could have a pair of complex eigenvalues. So moving right along. And again, it's sort of, I mean, there's no real way to break this material up. I'm sorry that... It's, it's always sort of annoying to have like six definitions just dumped on you. But the next case we're going to look at is called the proper node. And I... I really wish um, this terminology was not the way it is, 
Um, we're going to introduce proper and improper nodes. And because of a quirk of this terminology, you have to be really careful because proper and improper nodes are not nodes. To have a node, you need two different eigenvalues. Proper and improper nodes occur when you have one real eigenvalue. So it's really kind of weird terminology. So this is going to occur when you have one eigenvalue, but you have two eigenvectors. And a proper node, um, well, as a matter of fact, if you're in R2 and you have two eigenvectors, then a theorem from linear algebra says that, in fact, every vector is an eigenvector. Um, this is the picture that, that I put on the board way back here, the left-hand picture, where every initial condition near the node just goes in to the node along a straight line. Well, at least this is one of two pictures. If there's only one eigenvalue, that eigenvalue can be positive or negative. If the eigenvalue is positive, everything's going in along a straight line. If, what am I saying? Sorry about that. If it's positive, everything moves away. Along a straight line. And notice that in terms of stability, I've said, and I meant it, that proper nodes are not a type of node, but we think we are seeing sort of similar behavior. When we were looking at nodes, stuff being positive made the fixed point asymptotically stable, stuff being negative made the fixed point what am I saying? Why am I just, what happened? This is also the opposite of what I wanted to say. It's a pretty critical error, so I apologize for it.
And I mean, again, we we talked about this, so there is no excuse for my making that blunder. We talked about why being negative causes stuff to go to zero. Um, so if lambda is negative, I did. Let's see, do you have this written down correctly now? The origin is asymptotically stable. If lambda is positive, the origin is unstable. Questions, comments, concerns, anything? Then you, again, this is really awkward terminology. I mean, at least to me, this makes it sound like if um, if the fixed point is a node, then you have these sub cases. You classify the node as proper or improper. Again, that's not what's going on here. Um, proper node, improper node, and node are three mutually exclusive cases. One eigenvalue, and that eigenvalue has one eigenvector. So if we wanted to solve the um Solve the system, we'd be breaking out our generalized eigenvectors. Um, so we've got the fixed point. It's on the eigenvector. Let's look at the case where lambda is negative. So every um this fixed point is going to end up being asymptotically stable. So what happens here is that if we have a um a point up there, for example, well, it's going to be carried along by the eigenvector. So it's going to go in this direction. It's going to overshoot the fixed point. Then it's going to be start, start being carried along again by the same eigenvector. But now that it's overshot the fixed point, this eigenvector is telling it to turn around. and go in the opposite direction. So we get trajectories that look like this. And again, no wood improper nodes and proper nodes are three different cases, but they do have this in common. They all have one eigenvalue and, or no, they don't have that in common. They do have this in common, that the signs of the eigenvalues are controlling the stability. When the eigenvalues are negative, 
stuff's asymptotically stable when the eigenvalues are positive, the origin is unstable. Okay. You might notice, I'll talk briefly about this, or at least acknowledge it before we move on to the final cases. Um, but you might notice that one um, case we haven't looked at is the case where the eigenvalues or one of the eigenvalues is equal to zero. We've asked what happens when they're positive or when they're negative. And the answer is that an eigenvalue equaling zero gives you a mess. Um, if one of your eigenvalues is zero, then instead of just having the origin as a fixed point, you have an infinite number of fixed points, and it's all kind of a hassle to work with. And being a hassle to work with, um, I mean, we can do stuff that are hassles when it's necessary, but the main application of all of this is going to break when one of the eigenvalues is a zero. So since we're really interested in this for that application, and it doesn't work when lambda is zero, we're just not going to worry about lambda being zero. All right, so the cases that remain are what? Not sure. Well, I mean, think of like, think of if you were solving this equation instead of, um, instead of messing around and trying to analyze fixed points. I mean, we can solve it if we've got two real eigenvalues. We can solve it if we've got one real eigenvalue with two eigenvectors. We can solve it if we've got one real eigenvalue and one eigenvector. So the thing that we haven't talked about yet is what happens if we have um, complex eigenvalues. And we're running low on time, but complex eigenvalues. Um, can be a thought of, we, we can study all of these more or less at once. There are a few cases, but if we have complex eigenvalues, our solution is going to look like E raised to the real part or maybe I won't write that out. E raised to the A times T and then times some other stuff. And the other stuff is sines and cosines. And it's all stuck between negative one and one. 
or between negative C and C. I mean, it's bounded in any event. So we're going to have three cases and the sign of A is going to control the cases. So it doesn't make sense here to ask whether the eigenvalue is negative or positive, but we can ask whether the real part of the eigenvalue is negative or positive. If A is less than zero, we get a whirlpool going in towards the fixed point. And we say that this is an asymptotically stable spiral. If A is greater than zero, then we get a, I guess I don't really have a simile for you. We get an anti-whirlpool instead of spiraling in towards the fixed point. We spiral away from the fixed point. And we get an unstable spiral. And I said that we don't want to look at what happens when the eigenvalues are zero, but we will look at the case where the real part of a complex eigenvalue is zero. So here's the case where we have a fixed point and our trajectories are orbiting the fixed point. So the visual here is planets going around the sun. So we've seen plenty of asymptotic stability and instability. Here in this very last case, we'll finally see a neutral stability and the fixed point is called a center. I mean, the sun is the center of the solar system.